Well, good evening, everyone. It is a blessing to be with you, and it is a pleasure to be with you. It is always a pleasure to be about the Lord's business because that is the sum total of life, is to worship, to glorify, to magnify, and to recognize that he is working in each and every single one of us. None of us can say that we are individuals and we have our own private agenda that we can do. Everything is naked and open before the eyes of the Lord. And to that intent, we need to conduct our lives recognizing that we have a master. He is our Lord, he is our savior. And not only that, we are his bond servants. We have been bought, he's paid for us. And so as we were slaves of unrighteousness in the past, now we are slaves of righteousness. Slavery is a hard word in England because of the history, but that is history. And as much as I see the, the, uh, the church trying to pay reparations for the evil that they say the slave trade did, it's life. You know, if we hang on to, hang on to the past all the time, well, we're never going to get ahead. And Paul says we need to forget the past and to press on. And for that purpose, we gather together to continue trying to do that. So we have before us the Word of God, the most hated book in the world. In many places, if you're found with this, world, with this book, you're killed, or else you're sentenced to a life of imprisonment and torture. In other places, it is loved, as it is by many here in England, but not as many as we would like. But this book gives us life. This gives us hope. This gives us direction. It gives us understanding. A third of this book is prophetic. We're going to read some of the pro prophecies tonight, a few, of, a few of them that we can see coming out before our very eyes, and we can recognize them, and because of that, we're anxiously waiting for Jesus to come and take us home. I, I, I regularly remember Lot, and I remember Abraham's conversation with God, starting with 50. If there are 50 righteous, would you destroy it? No. 45, would you destroy it? No. 40, would you destroy it? Would you destroy it for 10? I wouldn't destroy it for 10. There weren't even 10 in the city. But still, he took Lot, his wife, and his daughters out before he rained fire down on the city and his wrath was brought down upon those, that city. And so I take that as an encouragement to me because we haven't been exposed, or we're not going to be exposed to the wrath of God, though we are going to be tried and tested. However, what I want to bring tonight is just a few um, pointers from things that have been proclaimed and prophesied as are going to happen, as are happening, and it all has to do with us human beings. So reading in chapter 4 of 2 Timothy, verse 1. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Now, before we continue with chapter 3, consider what we have just been reading. Consider the times in which we are living. Consider the population in whom and amongst whom we make our living and we go in and out and have to do with day by day by day and contemplate and notice that the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. We know that this speaks primarily to the church-going people. We know that it speaks, in my case, in my understanding, it will speak primarily to the leaders in the church. And when we consider what has happened in the church, we know that the leaders have failed miserably. They've turned away into the world, and as, as our brother Martin was praying, I thought that he was taking a leaf out of my book and was, was going to say what I'm wanting to say as well, but it just confirmed the state that we are in. 
and the state that the countries are in, not England alone, but all the countries are in a similar state. And this is quite extraordinary that all the world nations in a relatively short space of time have <clears throat> encompassed and accepted the same doctrine. This is not a man-made operation and not a man-made activating movement which has caused this to happen. I believe that it is principalities and powers which have caused this to happen. If you read the book of Daniel, Daniel was praying and he was fasting for three weeks. And from the first day of his fast and of his prayers, his prayers were heard. And the angel Gabriel was sent to Daniel. And he said to Daniel, from the first day, your prayers have been heard. And I have come to tell you what is going to happen. He said, but I was hindered and I had to fight against the prince of Persia because he was stopping me from coming. And he said, when I leave, I'm going to have to go and fight against the prince of Greece. Now, those are principalities and powers. Those are heavenly beings that we only read about and we do not see. It's mentioned in the book of Ephesians that our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the heavenly beings. Those are the driving forces. And if there can be a prince of Persia who is in control of the things of Persia and a prince of Greece who can be in control of the things of Greece, I see no reason why I cannot positively proclaim that there must be some principal power over England, over America, over Canada, over South Africa, over New Zealand, over Australia, over the Eastern countries. Why not? I haven't found anything in the Bible to say that it is not possible. But I have found in the Bible that it says we are not fighting against flesh and blood, but we are fighting against principalities and against powers. We do know and we are told in the book of Matthew, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. So when does an unclean spirit go out of a man? I believe he goes out of that man when the Holy Spirit comes along because there's no room for two people. And when the Holy Spirit comes, the man's life is swept, cleansed, made in order, set in order, and he changes and he becomes better for particular reasons is that evil cannot cohabit with holiness. So the unclean spirit goes out of a man and the unclean spirit is wandering around looking for a home as we all look for a home if we, wouldn't, if we didn't have a home and he finds none. He looks for a place to rest and he finds none. In the meantime though, what happens? Well, the church gets lazy. The members of the church get lazy because that is what the church is. And then the pressures of the world overtake, overpower, and smother them to the point that they then say, well, you know, we're doing things wrong. The Bible is outdated. This word can't be true. The pressures on us are too much. Everyone's right and we are wrong. We're so few, we can't be doing it properly. We better change. They must be right. And so just by the pressure of numbers, the few get overpowered because they're not relying on God. They're not relying on the word of God anymore, the truth of the word of God. They fail. And so they capitulate and they get taken captive by the enemy. So they're taken out of the fight. I say a fight because it is a fight. It's a war between good and evil, between truth and lies. And there's no other way to do it. This Bible that we have here, from the beginning of Genesis to Revelations, is a contentious issue between good and evil, right the way through, between right and wrong, between theft and trying to keep it good. 
The book is a book of war, and we are fighting for our very survival. If Satan wins, we're done. But we won't, he won't win, because greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. But if we let he who is in us, if we don't hold on to him, he will draw back because he is a God of love. He doesn't force me to serve him. He invites me to serve him. He says, come to me, all you who labor on a heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. He doesn't force me at a point of a sword. You better believe me or I'm going to chop your head off as some religions do. He's a gentle person. That is our living God, but he's also the author and finisher of our faith. He's also the creator of the world. He has full authority. And so what has happened is now he has delegated or relegated that authority to the wicked one, in a sense, because Adam gave it over. But he's using that in the world now to test the church what manner of spirit we are of. Each of us individually. The church is failing generally because what has happened is that unclean spirit that was in them and then they came, came to knowledge of the God, of, of, of the living God. Then they started failing. That unclean spirit left. Then he says, I'm going to go back and see what my house is looking like again. So he goes back and lo and behold, the house is empty. And he finds it swept, and he finds it put in order. So he goes, and he takes with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it be with this wicked generation. That is what we see happening in the churches. Evil has taken over the churches because the leaders... And as a result of the weakness of the leaders, the congregation to a large extent has followed. And so the, the last state of the church is right now in England, particularly because we are here, it has to do with us, is worse than the first because they have let God go. They're not holding on. They're not pressing on in the faith. They're not adhering to what they were given. Maybe they didn't know about it. Maybe it was just a form of religion. Maybe they were honoring God with their mouths, but their hearts were far from him. I'm not sure what the situation is, but I am sure that what is happening at the moment is God is not well pleased with the churches because the churches have failed. And there is a remnant who are still hanging on to the word of God and faithfully meeting week after week after week in difficult trying circumstances and situations and trying to make headway and holding on to what God has given us. But it all comes down to the individual effort that we each individually make and do. And why he tells us in that book of Timothy, he says there, we need to convince, rebuke and exhort with long suffering and teaching. And if we hang on to that, we will overcome and we will make it through to the end and we will not fail. But that is what, where we are at the moment in England and in the other Western churches because of the failure of the government, because of the power of the wicked one who is waiting to try and get everything that he can out of the church to make them all enemies of God. In chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, he goes on and he says, But know this, verse 1, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, or unreconcilable, unforgive, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Once again, a description of the churches in the times in which we are living. 
remembering that the churches are made up of individual people, individual leaders, individual spirits, individual souls, those who have at one time proclaimed that Christ is Lord, but now have, 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 have let go of what they had. And they have changed to, into their natural personality and character. That is who they in reality are. That is the human being that we are. When a baby is born, a baby lies from birth because we are born in sin. That's our natural character. That's who we are. And that's why the Lord says that we need to be saved. We need to be born again. That's where we, why we are told in the book of Ephesians that those who do not know God are blind. They're living in darkness. They do not understand. They are ignorant of the word of God, ignorant of the light which is available for them until they come to Christ. And Christ comes into our lives, he lightens up our lives and he enlightens it. And then by that, we are able to have a hope, the hope of salvation, which he has laid before us and which we can take hold of. And the more the, the world and the people descend into immorality, into the morass that they have descended into, the greater that hope becomes and the brighter our future becomes as we see the gap widening between where these people are going and where we are going to. But also with the same thing, because of that widening of the gap, it's becoming very, very evident those who are of Christ, of God, and those who are of the wicked one, just by their natures, by the characters, the difference of the two. It's a vast, vast chasm between the two, and neither of the two can meet because we are so different. A born-again believer finds it very, very difficult to stand in, the, in an assembly of unbelievers. In the pub, for instance, you go for a meal, and, and generally, if there are only men there, well, the conversation is untenable, and you have to leave because you cannot take what filth is coming out of their mouths for what the mouth by the heart is full of the mouth overflows with and that is what happens i have spoken to a number of people who have the same experience where we would rather be alone than have companionship with people like that and that is what the general tenor of the world is of the people in the world there is no hope of God, there is no love for God, there's a hatred for God, and the less that they have to do with anyone who professes God, the more happy they feel, because when they come across somebody who is born again, they feel condemned. But they will not admit that they feel condemned, rather that they will attack, because attack is the best form of defense. And so def to defend themselves, they will attack the believer, Verbally, we're told that through many sufferings we will enter the kingdom of heaven. And if we are faithful and are doing the job as we ought to do it, of which I fail miserably as well, we do not proclaim the word of God properly and enough. Otherwise, we would be suffering more than we are suffering for the kingdom of heaven. It's not an easy gospel. It's not an easy walk. It's a difficult walk to be able to do it the way that we ought to do it. It was so difficult that they crucified Jesus because he came up against the establishment, because he made himself to be God, he said. He was God. He was born as a man. He took on the form of a man. But he conducted himself, even before he began his ministry, he conducted himself in a manner which was accepted by God to the point that a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Before Jesus had done any good works, he had submitted in his spirit and in his childhood to his mum and dad, and he was exemplary in his, in his conduct in his community before he started his ministry. So when Jesus started, he had already been accepted by God. God being his father, but also God would not have accepted him if he had not been faultless, if he had not been walking in the manner which God expected him to do. However, he did. And that is the example that we have. And when Jesus went back to his hometown to preach, what happened there? They took him, they wanted to throw him over the hill because we couldn't take this. He, you know, who is this man? Who does he think himself to be? He was, he's the carpenter's son. He grew up here. And now look how he's elevating himself. 
We can't have that. And so because of their attitude and because how he came against them, well, they wanted to kill him. And eventually they did. They crucified him. And because they crucified him, we see what's happening in Israel today as they're fighting for their very existence. But Israel will sustain and it will come, carry on and it will be there because God has said that he will look after them no matter what. But they will be tested and they will be tried. That testing and those trials, they come upon each of us in various ways, in various means. But we need to always remember that when we go through the valley, Christ said, Jesus said he would be with us. Not that he would stop us from going through the valleys, but that he would be there comforting us, encouraging us and strengthening us. So how does it go? How does a man go from, from being a, a child of God, can I say, to, 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 to going to church and to singing the hymns and believing in God to the point where there's no more connection with the Lord? An interesting character is Demas. In chapter 4 of 2 Timothy, verse 10, Paul says there, in verse 9, be diligent to come to me quickly, speaking to Timothy, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Demas was a believer. Demas had been recognized by Paul to the point that he had said, at the end of the book of Colossians, his final greetings, he said there, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. He was lifting up Demas and saying, this is a good worker. This man is with me. And yet we read here in Timothy, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. That's what's happening today in the churches. People are loving the world because of the attractions of the world. Because what is happening in the world is far more relevant and personal and acceptable to people than that hope that we have of the kingdom of heaven. And so the stronger the world becomes, the weaker the church gets. And then what does God do about this? Well, in Romans chapter 1, he tells us what he does and why he does it. And it is because of the lack of ability of the people to hang on. So in Romans chapter 1, we read there in verse 22, professing to be wise, they became fools. And they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. And that is exactly what we see happening. So God gets involved and he gives them up to uncleanness. And then they carry on. And in verse 25, they exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. And so that is where we are going. The churchgoers are exchanging the truth of God for the lie. They're trading it. Just exactly the same as Adam and Eve traded their, their status with God for the lie when Satan came into them and he said to them, did re God really say? And Eve, say, Eve said no, and she twisted the word of God. And Adam then, because he loved his wife, went and obeyed what she had said. Have a, have a, have a bite, love. This is a lovely fruit. Come and eat some. He didn't say, well, we're not supposed to touch it nor eat of it. He took it to support her. And as a result, they believed Satan instead of God. And as a result, we're in the trouble that we have. And our first father is why we are born sinners, born liars, born thieves, born ungodly people until we become born again and have God's word coming upon us. And so these people worshipped and served the creature. Remember who the creature was? The creature was Satan. He is Satan. He was a created being until pride was found in him. And then he fell. 
And that was the first sin, pride, which Satan went, and he had been cast out. And so for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their woman exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Isn't it incredible that nowadays you cannot barely find a politician who can tell you what a woman is? They stumble over it. They sit there and they just don't know what to say. They cannot tell you what a woman is. Why are people so stupid? Why have they gone crazy? Why have they lost their minds? The only logical explanation is that it is a spiritual issue. There's no other common sense that a person cannot say, I'm a man. Well, I'm not sure what I am. I, you know, I might be a woman. I, I, I don't really know. I get these odd feelings now and again. Some stupid conversation. It, it, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make logical sense. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. That was the payment that they received because of their exchange. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over now, first giving them up and giving them up. He's given them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. The die is cast and humanity is fallen, not falling, it has fallen from grace of God. And as Sodom and Gomorrah were destined to be burned up, the earth is in the same state at the moment. We are not going to suffer that because we have been saved from the wrath of God. We're told that in the book of Thessalonians. God is not angry with us, but God is leaving us to try us long enough to test us to see what manner of spirits you're of. When Jesus was walking towards uh, Jerusalem. He had to go through a particular city. I forget the name of it. James and John were there, the sons of Zebedee. And the people where they were walking through did not receive Jesus. And they said to Jesus, Lord, let us call down fire and burn up these people who don't want to recognize you. And Jesus rebuked them, and he said, you don't know what manner of spirits you're of. Do we know what manner of spirits we are of? I believe that we do. That's why we are here tonight. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight of us. There could have been ten if Barry and Keith were here and not sick. But so few in this whole area going to church up here in Chartridge. Why is it so few? Because they are blinded. People, and as, Barry, as, as, as Martin, when he was praying, are too happy, too content, too lackadaisical. They've got enough. They don't need any more. And that's what people have said to me. They said, what do I need Jesus for? Look at my home. Look at my car. I've got a lovely family. Jesus, what do I need him for? I don't need him. I don't need him. That's sad. Because I don't need things either when I've got everything. But when I've got nothing, then I need lots. And when we stand before the Lord one day, if we do not have Jesus as our mediator, as our intercessor, to be with us at the judgment seat, then we are going to be in trouble. But thank the Lord that he said he'll never, never leave us nor forsake us. He'll always be with us. He'll keep us and watch over us and never let us be tried and tempted beyond what we are able. But when we look at the world, we have to look at it now through the eyes of the Lord and see why this is happening and get a reason for it. What's gone wrong? What's gone wrong? How can it be fixed? What should be done? The only thing that can fix it is God. The only thing that can fix it is people to recognize their brokenness, their helplessness, their hopelessness. When you take away all the physical things, that they are destitute and they are vulnerable and they are going to hell. But the blindness in them is so great. The darkness in them is so dark 
that they do not understand it, and instead they'd rather attack those that are bringing hope to them and let them see and understand what it is. They refuse to accept it. And so they're going to carry on on this road until the day comes when their time's up and they get called home. But we need to be encouraged. We need to keep going because our hope is in the Lord. Our understanding through the word of God is in the Lord. Do we trust what we read? I believe we do. If we didn't trust it, we wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here if I didn't trust this, if I didn't believe in this. To me, this is life. It tells me that one day I'm going to be okay. Maybe not so at the moment, but one day for sure. It's going to be great when we're in the kingdom of heaven. And so we mustn't lose heart. And when we look at the world and how far it's falling and how quickly it's falling, the quicker it falls, the further it falls, the faster it falls, the sooner I believe Jesus is going to take his church because the sooner it will be that judgment will be meted out upon the earth. It's already started when we look and see what's happening in Israel. The world wars are looming. There's threats of nuclear war almost daily now with what is going to, with what is happening there. And it just needs one little itchy trigger finger on a button to start an escalation that humanity cannot stop. We're at the end of the days. In the last days, men will be lovers of themselves. And that is exactly what is going on. There's no love for God in the world. There's only hatred. And we need to remember that we are those few who love God and our hope is in him. So let us just stand strong continually, consistently, constantly, walking, worshipping, praying, waiting, encouraging one another, exhorting one another, praying for one another, lifting one another up in prayer all the time. And God will supply and provide and protect. And so may the Lord bless you and may you continue being patient and walking in the light with him. God bless.